Hello colleagues, uh, you're very welcome to an interview with uh, Dr. Amin Mazin, who is uh, one of our colleagues and residents in Toronto. He'll make an introduction with himself. We are just now in Toronto at the end of one of the sessions of AATS for 2024. I'm delighted to meet with you, Mazin. My, my, I'm Marjan Jahangiri. I'm Professor of Cardiac Surgery at St. George's Hospital, University of London. Uh, what we're going to discuss is the ROS procedure, and uh, I leave uh, Dr. Amin Mazin to make an introduction about himself and his excellent presentations at an earlier session today. I mean, really nice. Uh, Pleasure to meet uh, you. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Just thank tell you. us a little bit about yourself, if you would, yeah. and uh, about the presentation. Yeah, yeah. So I'm a fifth year cardiac surgery resident here in Toronto. And uh, this morning we gave a presentation on uh, the ROS procedure mm -hmm. and the national trends in its utilization and outcomes across the STS database. Mm -hmm. um, so the main findings of the study was that the uh, uh, number of ROS procedures in North America are increasing. Um, that, that, was the, that was one of the main findings. We also saw that uh, operative mortality decreased steadily since 2008 and reached Nadir in 2020. And there's a slight uptick now in more recent years. I'm sorry to interrupt. What was it in the earlier years, the operative mortality? So, so in 2008, it was 2.8%. That was the operative 30-day mortality. And this was a, a number that was already reported by Brett recent colleagues who performed an analysis similar to the one we did from 1994 to 2010. Okay. As you know, in recent years, there's been renewed interest in the raw. So we were interested to see how those trends had evolved. Mm -hmm. And so what we saw was that... Uh, the mortality declined steadily and is now starting to pick up a little bit at the same time as more and more centers are performing the operation. That was one of the important findings. Another important finding was that the uh, majority of centers that perform or report the ROS procedure uh, are low volume centers, uh, with 44% of centers having performed only one ROS procedure in the entire 16 year study period. And there was a huge discrepancy. There were 10 centers that were high volume centers that performed 53% of all the ROS procedures in the database. So you can see that there's a big discrepancy with some very high volume centers and many, many low volume centers. Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt. Why do you think there's been a surge in interest in uh, the ROS procedure? I think it's a good question. I think it's most likely related to the uh, emergence in recent years of a significant body of literature now that shows excellent long-term outcomes of the operation. Mm -hmm. Our experience here in Toronto, Dr. David's cohort with excellent long-term survival, freedom from reintervention, Peter Skillington's in Melbourne, the German Ross Registry, uh, Dr. Costa's experience in, uh, in, in uh, Costa's experience in Brazil, and, and, and several others. And last not but not least, Professor Jakub Sieri, right. so with the That's first right. author of Dr. El Hamamsi at the Lancet. That's right. That's, That's right. excellent. Yeah. So tell us, what was the what were the other things that you think they were interesting uh, from this national study? So I think the most striking feature and really the take home message from this presentation was the volume outcome relationship. We saw that uh, across all eras uh, uh, that we studied, uh, there was consistently a much higher risk of operative mortality in low volume centers compared to high volume centers. And the little uptick in mortality at the end of the study was really driven by low volume centers. So I think that was the take home message. This is not an operation that can be uh, sustained uh, and performed safely and effectively unless you have a good volume of cases. This is an excellent summary that uh, Dr. Mazen has given us. Um, I mean, may I please ask you, um, just tell us, I want to take you through some pre-operative, operative and post-operative follow-ups. Who would you choose for this operation? Yeah, so if we're talking specifically about adults, of course in pediatrics it's a different story. Yes, adults. But, but adult patients, so there are we think about it through two lenses. One is patient factors, and the other one is anatomical factors. The ideal patient for the ROS procedure is a young or middle-aged adults with a long life expectancy, anticipated life expectancy, no major comorbidities, and ideally an active lifestyle. It is an especially appealing uh, uh, option for young women of childbearing potential who desire pregnancy. So that's a specific, uh, a specific subgroup of patients. So those, these are the anatomical fact, uh, the um, uh, patient-centric factors. For men, would you have an upper age limit, so, roughly? Yeah, so, so um, you know, less and less we think about it in terms of sort of chronological age. It's more about what their life expectancy is, 
what their uh, lifestyle is, are they active, you know, uh, okay. not all 55 or 60 year olds are created equal. I will say that in general, the older the patients get, the more we are looking for ideal anatomical substrates uh, to do the procedure. Whereas in a very young patient, even if the anatomy is not ideal, we might still push the envelope. And this brings me to my second point, which yes. is we talked about the patient specific uh, factors, but then there are anatomical factors. So the ideal anatomical substrate for a ROS procedure is aortic stenosis um, with a small aortic annulus. Yes. Especially in females, that combination gives almost perfect durability of the operation. Of course, nothing is perfect, but those are the patients that have the best outcomes. They have excellent long-term durability and very few fail. Uh, very few autographs fail in that setting. Of course, there's always the the, uh, the pulmonary homograph, but we can talk about that a bit later. But in general, that's the best the anatomy for it. Okay, let me just ask you about some, again, patient selection, just, just for our listeners. Um, would you choose patients with aortic regurgitation? Yeah, that, that's a good question. Let's so, say a 42-year-old uh, man yeah. who is an active sportsman. I mean, right. not a professional one, but really cares about his sure. exercise. Sure. So th the first thing I'll mention about aortic insufficiency is, of course, here we're talking about non-repairable aortic insufficiency. Yes. Uh, uh, the first option should always be repair. And, you know, oftentimes these are patients that can be treated with aortic valve repair or valve sparing root replacement. If we're talking about non-repairable aortic insufficiency, there's no doubt that it's a less that the ROS is less durable in these patients than in patients with aortic stenosis. However, and some patients and some uh, centers or some surgeons will say, well, in light of that information, we don't offer ROS in, in aortic insufficiency. Our approach is a bit different. As I said earlier, especially if the patients are young, especially if they're active, uh, we will perform the we will offer the ROS procedure. However, we will offer it with some technical modifications mm -hmm. that are aimed at stabilizing whatever the source of the aortic insufficiency is. So if the patient has, for example, annular dilatation, we'll perform an annular plastic. Yeah. Uh, if uh, the patient has insufficiency because of the light dilatation of the sinotubular junction, we'll uh, stabilize the STJ as well. So we will offer a modified uh, uh, ROS. Uh, ROS. Now, in our center in Toronto and in Montreal, where I did medical school, we uh, don't uh, do the ROS inclusion technique within the, yes. uh, the Dacron graft, uh, as Dr. Starnes presented earlier today. Um, we, we rather prefer either autologous inclusion or, or simply uh, a, an extra aortic annuloplasty just at the level of the annulus. We feel that um, you know, a lot of the benefits of the operation stem from the dynamism of the aortic root and that by uh, encapsulating it in a dacron graft, you lose some of those benefits. So that's just a sort of philosophical uh, so, stance. Again, a technical point uh, for our listeners. Uh, what about mismatch of mm -hmm. aortic valve on pulmonary valve? How much do you care about that? Yeah, so any mismatch more than two millimeters between the pulmonary, the pulmonary uh, autograft and the native uh, a, um, a recruit need to be addressed. Um, if you don't address it, that's a significant predictor of failure. So we do care. And in some cases, if the, again, if the mismatch is, is quite significant, that's a very suboptimal anatomical substrate. If the patients are older, we might, you know, sort of shy away from doing a ROS. And if the patients are younger and we think they need to, you know, they would benefit from the ROS, then we, again... You might accept. We, ta we accept, but we, we address it. And we try the best, uh, best we can to restore sort of to symmetry match. to match to it. Match. Yeah. Okay. Um, patients with connective tissue disease? So, generally speaking, uh, Marfan syndrome, Lois Dietz uh, patients are not candidates for the ROS. Uh, again, most of these patients are treated with valspar root replacement. Um, and, and if it's not feasible, usually we'll go towards a bentol. We've not done uh, uh, the ROS in patients with connective tissue diseases of that nature. Now, of course, a lot of these patients will have bicuspid aortic valve, and bicuspid aortic valve associated aortopathy that we would not consider a contraindication to the ROS. Yeah, absolutely. Look, um, uh, as you heard, uh, Dr. Mazin touched upon, I mean, you touched upon uh, volume outcome relationship. Yeah. I think it's a hugely important concept yeah. in cardiac surgery and in some parts of the world is overlooked and I think that's totally wrong. Yeah. For example, I think one of the reasons that we all find coronary artery bypass graft surgeries, adult cardiac surgeons, the easier end is because we do lots of it. That's right. Otherwise, it's a highly technical and complex yeah. microsurgery. Yeah. It's just the volume has yeah. uh, made it easier. Now, let's say you're in your training, you're in this last third, I, I, I think. Um, 
let's say in a year or so, how many Rosses would you like to see assistant as first assistant or do parts of it and then go solo? Yeah. What would you say would make you confident? Yeah, so the, the data that's available in the literature published by uh, Dr. Hams, he says that for a surgeon to overcome the learning curve of the Ross procedure, it takes about 70 cases as primary surgeon. Now, you know, that's a, a significantly high number. I think, um, I think as a trainee, if you want to embark on this operation, you need dedicated training. You need to do certainly a, a fellowship in aortic root surgery. You need to see a, a significant number of these cases because there are a lot of technical subtleties. In addition, it should be mentioned that you should have a lot of familiarity with aortic root procedures, valve sparings, bentols, uh, you know, you, it, I think this is an excellent point. If I may, please, please, I'd like to emphasize this for all our trainees who may develop an interest in the RAS procedure or aortic root replacement procedures. These are highly technical areas of surgery, and we've heard also presentations earlier today. I think it was in the room next to you or first thing in the morning that about the technical pitfalls of this operation that it can really affect outcome. Mm -hmm. So you're quite right that... Uh, our trainees have to train in root surgery, aortic valve surgery, root surgery, and then the ROS procedure and valve sparing group. You quite rightly highlighted some of the limitations of a voluntary registry, mm -hmm. which of course, let's say if I'd done 10 cases, forgive me, and nine had had complications or didn't do well, for sure I wouldn't be submitting. I mean, naturally one wouldn't want to submit all of it. One would, but there is a risk that one wouldn't. So you've highlighted the limitations of a voluntary registry. However, in whatever we have, the follow-up is limited. But in your experience of what you've seen from doing this study or working in Toronto, do you, do you see problems with right ventricular outflow tract mm -hmm. as a real problem? Yeah, so, so we're lucky in Toronto because, you know, Dr. David started this operation a long time ago and we have now over 30 years of follow-up. As time goes on, you start seeing more and more patients coming back with pulmonary homograph issues. Uh, and I, I suspect this number is just going to increase as we get into the fourth and fifth decade. Now, thankfully, um, these can be tolerated for a very long time. Uh, be it pulmonary stenosis or insufficiency. The other thing is increasingly these patients are being treated percutaneously. I'd say in our experience, about two thirds of patients uh, who present back with problems on the pulmonary homograft side, uh, um, when they meet a threshold for intervention, usually are intervened upon percutaneously, about two thirds of them. That's really important. So yeah. it can be dealt with uh, percutaneously yeah, yeah, because yeah. one of the operations I used to uh, assist and then do was changing of the homograph in the mm. right ventricular outflow yeah. tract some years ago and it actually gets more and more complex mm -hmm. when it gets to the second one and the third one. Yeah. Um, I mean this has been excellent and thank you very much for your time and your excellent presentation earlier. Uh, colleagues if you wish to see Dr. Mazin's presentation it will become available online through the AATS uh, 2024 portal. Thank you. Thank you very much thanks for having me.